Jane, if you could. Thank you. If you could just um, uh, stop your video screen so that you're not part of it after all. And obviously, people are just going to keep on coming in. So, um, but I think what we'll do is get started while we're here now. Uh, my name's Suzanne Leal, for those of you who don't know me, and uh, this is Thursday Book Club, which is a weekly book club, which is um, stress free and that there's no books to read and you don't have to turn up in time, nor do you have to stay the whole time. Once a month, we have a special guest, uh, a special guest author, and I'm delighted tonight to have Marion Thrift as my guest. Welcome to you, Marion. Hello. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you. And it's really lovely to have you. I'm just uh, getting people in. We've got a nice little lineup. Um, what I'm going to do is just show everybody your book. Now, this is the uncorrected proof, which was, I was lucky enough to, um, to get. So I had a, um, had an, had a uh, sneak peek into the book before it was out. I'm thinking maybe, uh, Marion, do you have a copy of the book there, the, the finished oh, version? Doesn't matter if you don't. I'm not very good at publicising myself. <laughs> can I abandon my post for two seconds or not? You can. You can abandon your post. And I'll hold I'll hold. There are my mantelpiece. Hang on. So the novel is called Here in the After, as you can see, and it's a publication by HarperCollins. And um, Marion is a debut author, although, as we'll find out, she's certainly uh, not new to the field of writing. But she's embarrassed because she's... So new, she doesn't have her book with oh, her. Oh, that's really? the interviewer's <laughs> fault. The interviewer should have been. <laughs> Hello. So, so, so uh, Marion, just show me one more time. Just show me the 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 the, the full book. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's a. I think it's a really delicate, uh, impressive cover that that really stands out. So, the back. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Ill prepared. So this this book has been out since September last year. Tell me, in the lead up to the public to the release of the book. How did you feel? Was it a feeling of nervousness? Was it excitement? Well, this is my first book and I'm older than a lot of first-time authors. So it was um, it was actually a really lovely feeling, but it was also a strange feeling because you suddenly, you work on this. You know, I've been a journalist, I've been a writer all my life, so I'm used to writing and putting stuff out there and having it critiqued. But, of course, this is really personal. And so suddenly before it's published, you get this realization oh people are going to read it you know people are going to read it this very private personal thing that I've invested my soul in strangers are going to look at it and they're going to have an, an opinion about it so I think it was sort of excitement mixed with trepidation and fear. And isn't that the contradiction of writing where it's a solitary uh, endeavor but in order to make a living get it out there it needs to belong to the world so if you you need to write without being self-conscious, but then you need to throw it all away to give it to the world and publicise it. Do you find that dichotomy a difficult thing? Yes, I do. I mean, I think, you know, it's not a case of the words that can just speak for themselves because you do have to engage. And I think that was the shame with COVID. You don't get the chance to engage with readers and sort of present yourself and what you wanted to do. But coming out of that bubble, that solitary writer's bubble, to sort of look up to the light, if you like, I mean... It's also incredibly rewarding because you've reached a point where you are ready to let go, where others tell you you're ready to let go. So there's a leap of faith too. So, yeah, there's the contradiction, but I think there's a lovely sort of merging of those that come at some point, you know, at the end. And, of course, all the sweeter perhaps because the lead time for a novel is so much greater than for an article as a journalist. Did you find the, the length of the lead time Odd when you've been used to working to quick deadlines. Yes, it was like, okay, hit send, and then, oh, it takes a year. <laughs> like it's, it's quite funny, and because you, it's not finished, but it's gone, so it hasn't happened. So you've got all those sort of um, anxieties. You would know this, of course, much better than I. Perhaps you don't have them, but, you know, oh, if only I could have another edit, if only I could have another pass at it. You know, it's a shame there's so much time because it just gives you time to dwell on it. But, yeah, it's, it's a strange process. I'm wondering if that's the reason why so many people just go straight on to the next book, apart from the uh, financial necessity or apart from the, wanting to have an output that's very quick. I'm wondering if it's a way of stopping the nervousness about the book that's already gone that you now can't get back 
and to stop you dwelling on it. Do you think I, you're speaking about like Chris Hammer, who um who writes immediately, he's finished. Yes. I've been thinking about that. And I'm wondering, do you think that might be some something for writers that to just move quickly to the next project might allay that stress of the one that's not quite out? Not quite out. I think so, because also there is a, um, you have created a, a momentum and a routine and a discipline. I think also as you're getting to the end of a book, you are letting go of it in a way, you know, how many times can you read it? You know, you, you know it backwards, you're, you're almost done with it. So you're looking for a new challenge. I mean, I, I, in a way, wish I'd done that, like I am working on something else. And I wish in a way I hadn't sort of stopped to sort of gather my breath, because I think once you do step away from that very disciplined routine, it's, um, it's easy to, to, to get out of it. But yeah, I think there's something about not wanting to wait around, but to want to keep going. I, I know from our participants tonight, that there are a number of writers amongst us here, as well as you and me. And I just wanted to remind everybody that, look, if you do have questions, given the numbers, what I might do is ask you to write any questions in the chat uh, facility. And when Marion and I get to the end of our talk, then there'll be time for uh, Marion to answer your questions as well. So I want to go back to the book or straight to the book here in the after. It's published last year. For me, it's the story of a pretty unlikely friendship at first glance between a woman, Anna, and a young man called Nat. For the benefit of those who haven't read it here tonight, could you introduce us first to Anna and then to Nat, please? Yes. Um, Anna, is, Anna is 62 and she's a woman who's been very successful in her life at work. She holds quite a senior executive position. She's um, married, she's affluent, she's comfortable, she's got a, a family. So she's quite sorted. Um, she's lived a life and she's sorted. And she, she steps out one day and her life changes irrevocably. And so we then discover who Anna is really in her internal self and how her age actually becomes a gift, you know, being an older woman and the wisdom she's accrued over that lifetime. She's a, um, she's very damaged by her experience. So the Anna we know is a very serious and anxious and traumatised woman. So we don't get a lot of glimpses of who she was before. We get a small glimpse of that towards the end. I really like her, like I'm incredibly fond of her. I know her, I know, um, I, I know her in my heart. And she's a very, um, a very compassionate woman. She's really nice. I think, I think most of us would like her if, if we could get to know her and she lived next door. And I think it's not spoiling anything for us to talk a little bit more in detail as to what exactly has happened to okay. her. I mean, it comes to the fore in the first chapter and it's really quite confronting. Where do we find Anna in that very opening chapter of your book? The opening chapter of the book, Anna is walking out into a very quiet urban environment that we don't know a lot about. It's a street that she references used to be very busy and it's incredibly quiet. In fact, the setup is that she's being walked out to be executed in public as a um, as a piece of propaganda for an extremist um, terrorist organization so she has been held captive in a hostage situation and she's the sole survivor so the opening scene is her making that walk and her internal reflections as she makes that walk and prepares to die she doesn't die because there's a book but um that's the setup it's a very powerful setup i think and um that's how we meet her. We meet her in, in very challenging circumstances. And indeed, it's because of those circumstances that Nat and Anna themselves meet. And Nat is the one who first comes to see Anna. Who is Nat and how does he come to first know who Anna is? Nat's 35. He's a young man and he's been in the Australian Army and has two tours of Afghan. Of Afghanistan behind him so he's a veteran and he is sitting at home watching the news following the news of the siege that's happening in Sydney 
and gets into contact with his mates, his old army mates. Obviously, they're incredibly heightened by what's happening. They're trained to know how to respond to this situation, but now they're civilians, so they're impotent. You know, they're stuck on their suburban couches around the country. He is incredibly triggered for complex reasons and reasons that not everybody else understands, but he feels very strongly that this is his fault. He has complex PTSD. He feels this is his fault, that he believes that the job he was given to do was to stop terrorism on foreign shores so it would never come here, to protect Australia, in effect, in, in, in his sometimes muddled thinking, but he believes he failed the task that he was given by the government was to put an end to terrorism. And he didn't, because it's here, it's you know a few suburbs away. He's really, really triggered, as I said, and unravels quite quickly and becomes adamant that he needs to find Anna. There's footage of her being lifted into an ambulance and Nat feels he has to find her. He owes her an apology. He needs to explain that this is his fault. I mean, he's unwell and his reactions, um, you know, go to quite a far point, but the seed of what he's feeling is shared by others too. So he's a, he's a really... Um, to many people, he's a really difficult young man. Um, some readers don't like him. Others adore him. He's um, very Australian. He's got a beautiful young wife who um, is married to actually a demon. Domestically, he's a horror because of his trauma and his illness. So he's a very complex young man. And he, he and Anna do connect and do develop a friendship, an incredibly powerful friendship that really um, their families and others just can't understand. Nat, as you've said, is a veteran of Afghanistan, but I found as I was reading it, in his ruminations, there was much that reminded me of the Vietnam War and the experience of those veterans that came back. Do you have a particular interest in the Vietnam War, either professionally or personally? I, I have an interest, I have, a, I have an interest, you know, um, in the in all conflict really in from the personal perspective you know that we ask people to fight and we train them to fight and then they come home and of course Vietnam was a very um a terrible experience for veterans returning who felt that they were not were not acknowledged they were despised you know literally spat on some of them as baby killers and as a journalist actually I went to the very belated welcome home parade for veterans 20 years later in Canberra um, and that was an incredibly moving event you know these men that had that had done what they were asked to do many of them conscripted of course for Vietnam and um, came back to such a hostile or non-existent reception so yeah I'm interested in that I, I have you know military stories in my family you know Kokoda and Gallipoli and I'm I'm interested in how, I want to say young men, because traditionally it's been that, but young service people come home from war and assimilate and just get on with life. You know, I think, um, as I think I ruminate on the book, you know, come home and work in the local post office and never mention the, the Western Front again. So, yes, it's something that I, I've had a long, a long interest in, really. A lot of books focus on the event. Mm -hmm. So the horror that happens or um, the marriage, the, the wedding that is about to happen throughout the book and then finally does. Mm -hmm. uh, less books look at what happens after that. So after the end of the war, after the marriage has been finalised, or at least the wedding has been finalised, um, are you interested in those events themselves or are you really more interested in going under the rock to see what's left over or to look at the rubble? I'm more interested in that, you know, so I watch the news of Ukraine tonight and I straight away think to the future and to those people, you know, to, to, to the stories that will come out of that, the, the horrendous stories that are being shaped, you know, tonight as we talk about, uh, talk about, talk about this. Yes, I, I'm interested in the events, of course I am, but I'm more interested in, in 
the dominoes that then fall. Someone said to me um, that we usually look at conf uh, usually look at trauma from an external perspective, as you say, like look at the events, look what happened. And in this, I'm looking at it very much from an internal perspective, you know, from from within the people who have been um, hurt. And and that was what I wanted to do because I, I wanted to step back from what it looks like. There's a bit of that, of course, you know, we see what happens to both these people, but to then try and get inside their, their hearts and their souls, if you like, to see how, 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 do, how do you manage that? How do you survive that? And that's what I wanted to look at. And I think for me, that's what, what made the book particularly interesting because it, it could start at the end and indeed, for many of us, after reading about the Lint siege um, that happened some years ago, uh, the end of that story was the rescue, um, or at least the, 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 the end of the siege where there were some people released. But in fact, for you, this is the very beginning of the book. Is that a harder job, do you think, to keep momentum and keep the reader with you? I don't know. Um, as I say, I mean, that's the setup, that's the suspense. And then you read the back of the book and you realised, oh, I see, she must have survived. I don't know. I played around with where to place that setup, you know, where to have that chapter, whether to have it at the top or to, to save that to the end. But I thought it was, I thought it was important to have it as the opening because, yeah, that's what happened. Then what? And that's the story I wanted. So I wanted that out of the way. We get more detail later. But I wanted the drama of what was going to trigger the action actually to be the starting point. So that, yeah, was it hard to keep up momentum? the whole thing was hard like a first time book is hard so it was all hard there was just grades of hard that's interesting so the the, the title that you you, you um, have is here in the after which is a very poetic title and your writing is poetic it could just as easily have been called so then what yes yeah, so then what yeah it could be called so then what so then what in fact that could be a series so then what and you could look at a, a million events yeah, it, well, it is so then what? That's what the story is, so then what? And, and, and I was, uh, one of my motivations was I'm, um, I'm a bit of a news junkie and you watch that, you, you watch the news, you, you know, you, you, you watch it on television, you're online, you're, you're reading print, you see those faces, you hear those interviews, we'll see them tonight, you know, you see the faces, you hear the interviews, you see the footage, and then it rolls on, you know, we don't see them again. We move on to the next night. And that was a motivation, I suppose, in this writing to try and just freeze the frame for a minute. Let's just freeze it for a minute. And as you say, and, and then what? And I mean, you know, we have journalism documentaries in that when we go back and follow, but I just wanted to sort of seize that moment, hold that, a lot more going on globally around this particular story and domestically, but just freeze it there and, and follow this. This one, this one survivor, but these two people that are so deeply impacted by it. Is that one of the things that distinguishes fiction writing from your journalism? That you, in journalism, can you say that, freeze this and then look at it clearly or not? Or is that something that needs longer form, longer time and perhaps... Oh, well, of course, there's, there's, there's so many forms of journalism. Of course, in long-form journalism, you, 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 you can do that. And I, I always was a feature writer, so I had the luxury of being able to sort of step back from the news and dig around a little bit more. But yes, of course, in fiction, you can take it as far as you want. So one of the greatest challenges that I found in moving from, from journalism, I was also a ministerial speech writer, so from that sort of writing to trying to write a novel was in journalism, you are um, constrained by the truth. Everything has to be true. You have to be able to, well, in the old days, you have to be able to prove it's true. So it's fact driven. Everything is a fact that has to be able to be checked and be verified. When you turn to fiction, none of it's true. Like it's all made up. And I found that actually quite difficult to take the reins off. You know, like, oh, who am I to say? Oh, can I say that? Can I say that? And the irony was as I was working on this story and it does go into some dark places. And there was one point when I thought, when I was um, writing something that I had, um, created as happening you know in Afghanistan in a you know a conflict situation I actually stopped and I thought to myself you know am I going too far you know am I 
I'm going too far. I can I just make this up? And then the very next day on the um, on the news, there was an incident that was reported that I won't reveal because it gives some clues. But there was an incident reported, a horrific incident reported involving ISIS that that actually mirrored the crime that I was creating. So maybe even what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is even though to step from journalism to fiction, you move away from fact to, to fantasy, maybe actually the divide is not as great as you think, or maybe I'm subliminally looking for a story that has its roots in, in current affairs. I don't know, I'll need, I don't know. I think the subconscious works in extraordinary yeah. ways, doesn't it? I mean, information yeah. that you don't think you've taken in that um, plays a stronger part than you yeah. might have imagined. So, are yeah. you um, are you sated now? You've you've got one novel under your your belt. Is that is that it for you and fiction? I, I keep glancing down because I keep looking at it because I put it here. It's like, oh yeah. Um, am I sated? No. I think I think if anything, it whets your appetite, doesn't it? Uh, to to try and do it again and to do it better and to take the skills that you've learned and the lessons you've learned and, and build on those. So no, I'm not sated, I'm um, activated. And um, anything about what you're writing next or are you someone who likes to keep that to yourself? It's, well, I like to keep it to myself simply because myself hasn't quite worked it out, but I have a number of very strong characters that I've formed that I feel very happy with and now I've got to work out what they do. So. There's nothing to reveal yet. Some writers, when they're writing, find it difficult to read as well. Other people um, read all the time, no matter what stage of writing they're at. Which are you? Are you the writer? I, re read? I read at the same time. Uh, I read. I read as I'm writing. And in fact, I I went back and reread books that I'd loved while I was working on this. You know, because to try and remind myself why I'd loved them so much, what had stuck in me. So I was reading for pleasure, but also um, almost as homework, you know. So I'd, I'd, I'd been reading for pleasure all my life and then I'd, I'd, I'd work on my own book during the day and then I'd pick up someone else's and sort of probably have a smile on my face for most of that reading time in the evening going, wow, they were clever, they did this, they did that. So, yeah, I do both. And if the, you had to give three books uh, to recommend to our book clubbers, what books would they be? Well, I actually, I've actually read these three books quite recently and I've loved them all. So the first one, many people would probably know, Once There Were Wolves, mm. Charlotte McConaughey. It's a beautiful book. I actually had COVID I, and I had COVID very badly a few weeks ago and I was stuck in bed with this. It's so beautiful. The writing's beautiful. The story's beautiful. Like it's a great story. I really loved it. So it sort of flicks into, it, 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 it flicks genres, if you like. It sort of turns into a bit of a um, whodunit in the middle. So this is gorgeous. She did Migrations, of course, a few years ago, which I haven't read, which had, you know, rave reviews. So I've got it as well. But Once There Were Wolves is beautiful. This is a great read. So oh, yeah. Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's just a great story. Talk about a piece of storytelling. This is fabulous. It's, um, it's about a female aviator and, and it's just great. So it's set in two time zones. It's one of those. And it's really compelling and it weaves and it jumps around. And I don't think I've had such a great, well, it's called on the front, ferociously clever, distinctive and dazzling. And I think that's fair. So I loved that. A really great read. That's one I'm telling everyone to read. This is a beautiful book that a lot of people probably haven't heard about. Can you see it? The Girl with the Louding Voice. Oh. And it's by a Nigerian writer and her name is Abby Dare, I think, D-A-R-E with an acute on it, Abby Dare. It's a beautiful story. So it's written with a... Um, an African voice. It's a girl, a young girl. She's 14. She wants to go to school, of course, and she's married off to an older man and life does not go well for her. But she really does have the most beautiful voice. You can just feel, I've not been to Nigeria, but the language and the description is so evocative. 
And this young girl is so um, courageous and such a survivor. It's a really beautiful and surprising read. I never would have found it myself and someone gave it to me really lovely. So they would be my three suggestions for people who want, you know, to have a good read, sit down with a great book. Oh, fantastic. I'll add that to uh, the weekly newsletter as your recommendations so um, everyone can, uh, can, can know them. Now, we're coming towards the end of the time and um, I'm mindful that there will be questions. Now, um, you can put them in the chats, but also if you'd like, I'm just going to change my view so I can see you. So if anyone would just like to um, raise their hand, if you do have a, a question, no pressure. This is the No Pressure Book Club. So um, I have plenty more if, um, if all your questions have already been answered. So just just give me a hand if um, if there is something that you want to know. Otherwise, I'll keep moving on. Marion, one of your um, one of your skills, apart from journalism and speech writing, is uh, re resolving family law disputes. Can you tell me how you came to have an expertise in that? What, what, what was it that interested you about that? Well, uh, that makes me sound cleverer than I am. When I, I, um, I got out of, I went from journalism to corporate communications and, as I say, ended up, you know, as a ministerial speechwriter and that sort of, I was, there was time for that to end. You know, I detoured a, a bit far to the right and I decided to, to stop that and have a career change and I tr retrained as a um, family dispute resolution practitioner which is, is, is mediation for people before they go to the family court and that was great like I loved that because I am really interested in people I'm, I love the notion that you actually don't know anything about anybody Mm -hmm. until you sit down with them and sort of learn their stories. So I did that for not, not for a very long time. I trained and then worked for a while and then decided to, to, to put that aside and give the novel a go. But it was really, really incredible work to be privileged to be able to do, to sit with people at their most difficult moments when they're trying to work out how to move forward, you know, through a relationship breakdown and help them work out what to do with kids. It was really... I loved it, but in the end, I decided there was something else I wanted to do. And without saying that this would be something you'd necessarily write about, are the experiences you got from this dispute resolution things that prompt or inspire issues to consider in your writing? Yes, I think so, because, I mean, you would know this too. I think what you learn when you do work with people who are hurting, that actually... People's hurt explains a lot. It ex explains how they act and who they are. And the lesson is to try and understand, you know, to walk a minute in someone's shoes to understand what who they are. And I guess that's what I've tried to do with Anna and Nat. They, you know, they can be not very likeable like people at times. They can be nasty, you know, they can be really cruel to their family. And when you actually look at why, what, what's driving them, what's happened to them, I think it's impossible not to have empathy. And I think that's probably something I learned from that, you know, sitting with people, them talking at length about what had happened, what they needed, their fears, their hopes. So yeah, I think, the, I think it informs me simply because I'm privileged enough to have very intimate conversations with people and that's how you learn isn't it right that's how you learn who we are as people and and that basically we're all everybody is just someone trying to get ahead and minimize hurt and nurse their own wounds you know so yeah it it, it does inform I think I've got one last question for you just before I ask you that question um can you give me a number between one and 26 I'll explain why Yes. What, 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 what's your number? Oh, do I have to tell you? I did this with a child. Yes, I, I can't do magic. I did it with a child oh, earlier <laughs> today and I, the point was not to tell them the number because they actually guess it. My number is 14. 14. Thank you very much. Um, the last question I have for you is that we've spoken a lot about trauma tonight, but I think apart from the trauma you described so, so carefully, there's a ribbon of hope and, and quite a thick ribbon of hope that runs through your book. Was that important? Was it important? Oh, oh absolutely. One of hope? 
absolutely so. absolutely and i hope that in i hope in a way it's more than a thick ribbon i hope it's sort of it it, it yeah well yeah thick ribbon's good absolutely because i do believe there is hope in in all situations now that sounds arrogant when you sit in a you know position of privilege and safety in a functioning democracy etc but there is and i think the saying you know um you know no life without hope and that was really important for me to sort of portray that because both these people life is very black they have seen things that they can't imagine they can ever 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 get over how many people in the world have seen horrendous things all of them and I wanted to grab the hope that I think as human beings we all have I mean, there is a strive to live, isn't there? And to, and to keep going and to get on that boat with your children and to flee from that and to grab your baby. That's hope. That's, that's hope. And it was very important to me in these, I'm describing two contemporary um, scenarios that will be very real and possibly very triggering for some people. And I wanted to explore the hope because I believe hope is real. And I wanted to help my characters find it within themselves. And um, because I think in most, in most instances, there is hope. And often people just need help to find it, you know. We've been in some pretty tricky times in terms of the world. I mean, I think I've been affected less than, than, than many people. But it, it's been a tricky couple of years, what with, with COVID, the world scenario. Um, what gives you hope in times that have been so uncertain? Um, what gives me hope? I think, I think what gives me hope is probably what is woven into that book too. I think it's, I think it's children. I think it's new life. I mean, that's what gives me hope. If you look forward, it can be a bit overwhelming. Oh, my goodness, what have we done? But if you look back at those, you know, at those newborn babies, at that toddler learning to walk, at that little child putting on his school backpack and, you know, fronting up to kindergarten for the first time, that's what gives me hope, you know, that, that the cycle of life is a continuum it's always being refreshed, you know, so as jaded and battered as we might be, there's this whole new little army coming up behind. So children and the natural world both give me hope. So basically um, I can access both of those quite easily. So it's not hard to find hope for me. And the ocean, I spend a lot of time looking at the uh -huh. ocean and, you know, it's impossible not to feel that anything is possible when you look out to that blue. Thank you, what a lovely way to end. And just before we do finally end, um, we have a raffle once a month on Thursday Book Club. Ooh. And um, I don't have any high tech way of choosing the raffle. So my guest chooses a number and I do a bit of fancy math. Oh, okay. And the winner that I have come up with um, on the basis of your number is Georgia Martin. So congratulations Georgia, to Georgia. Now, so if Georgia would like to send me an email, um, then I can, with her address, then her prize will be sent to her. So um, oh, uh, congratulations, uh, Georgia Martin. And thank you, everybody, for your attendance here. Hope to see many of you again next week, 8 o'clock on Thursday. And um, to my guest, Marion Thrift, thank you very, very much for your time and your generosity and your thoughts. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. How lovely. I hope to be back next time sitting in one of those little grids. What a lovely, <laughs> what a lovely thing. We're thank a nice you, everybody. Bunch, but please yeah. come and join us. We, yeah, we I'll fun. fill in that little black square there. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Really lovely. You're so supportive of um, writers and new ones like myself. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, have, have a nice evening, everybody else. Yeah, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.